all of you, all of you for being here. Uh, we are super happy. We are super proud, and it's extremely exciting uh, having you all here. Uh, it's a very great opportunity for networking, for really, actually, for the for the local stage of marine energy. Uh, having this event today here is means a, a big chunk, really, really. So. Firstly, I would like to, to thank all of you. I will read uh, some words because I, I really don't want to forget anything uh, and anyone, of course. And uh, actually, my, my uh, capability of improvisation is quite limited, so I prefer to read. <laughs> so, so I'm here today with immense pleasure as we gather for the opening ceremony of the NIN Core 2023 Marine Energy Workshop. It is an absolute delight to extend a warm welcome to all our attendees, both from near and far, who has given us the great opportunity of being your host. Today, we feel really proud as we witness this resounding the success and widespread acceptance of this event, not just within the borders of Argentina, but on the international stage as well. The growth of marine energy has been known nothing short of remarkable, and the massive turnout of this, uh, for this workshop is a crucial, crucial driver uh, to the short dedication we all have towards advances, advancing this pivotal field. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge and express our gratitude to the individuals and organizations that have played a pivotal role in bringing this event to success. Without your support and commitment, uh, uh, today's gathering wouldn't have been possible. I would like to uh, allow me to mention a, a few key contributors who have been instrumental. Firstly, the Center for o Ocean Energy Research, CORE, uh, of, uh, also, uh, of course, part of the organization of this event, represented by its director, Professor John Ringwood, on my left, and his team, including Carry and uh, Barry. CORE's, uh, CORE's initial support and the decision of Professor Ringwood to hold this eight wave energy workshop in Buenos Aires has been essential in making this workshop here a reality. A reality. In particular, I would like to mention that Professor John Ringwood, as I'll explain later, later, initially suggested to move the eight wave energy workshop to Argentina. The Mole Energy Lab, also part of the organization of this event at the Politecnico di Torino, Italy, and the collaborative efforts of Professor Giuliana Matiazzo uh, and Dr. Giuseppe Giorgi. Mondragon University, represented by Dr. Markel Penalva and Dr. Anders Arqueta, also here today for their support. Partners from Chile, from Universidad de Valdivia, Americ, Dr. Gonzalo Tampier, here, and Marco Diorio, respectively. The Center for Computational Simulation, CSC at CONICET, particularly Dr. Alejandro Otero, co-chair of the NIN Core 2023, as well for Professor Paul Puleston, Professor Gerardo Acosta, Dr. Facundo Mosquera, and Dr. Sofia Diaz Vélez for their active involvement as part of the organizing committee. The industry that have shown unconditional support and enthusiasm for participating in the, in the industrial uh, presentation block, such as ETEC, INBAP, INSA, Brooks Marine, La Ola Group, Genesis, and notably QM Equipment for their active membership in REMA. Pampa Azul Initiative, coordinated by Dr. Juan Emilio Sala and Dr. Pablo Núñez, and here represented by Dr. Daniel Fernández, on my right, uh, from Universidad de Tierra del Fuego, for their invaluable support. Pampa Azul has been an active actor for getting the venue for the workshop. Juan said, for considering the proposal that the Argentine, Argentine network for marine energies becomes a concept network which could open up new horizons for marine energy research and funding. I would like to mention also our dedicative universities that are integral parts of REMA. Universidad de, Universidad de Buenos Aires, Universidad de Quilmes, Universidad Nacional de La Plata, Universidad Nacional de Mar del Plata, Universidad Tecnológica Nacional, Universidad de San Andrés, and Universidad Nacional del Centro. The National Water Institute, INA, particularly Dr. Uh, Pablo Garcia, Dr. Mariano Rey, and Dr. Nicolas Tomasin for their contribution to the field, but mainly for being an active part of REMA. The Ocean Engineering Society and IEEE Argentina, represented by Professor Gerardo Acosta, and their continuous, uh, for their continuous support. Sorry. Last uh, but not least, we thank the Ministry of Science and Technology, MINCIT, for their unconditional support, particularly for providing the Centro Cultural de la Ciencia, C3, which emphasizes the event's priority and underscores 
their dedication to the growth of marine energy. This combined effort and support has transformed the vision of NIMCOR 2023 into a reality, and we are deeply grateful for uh, your commitment. In particular, I would like to highlight this event as the first in-person meeting of the Argentine Network for Marine Energy, REMA, which means to paddle or rowing in Spanish. REMA is resolutely committed to promoting transformative change by facilitating collaborations among academia, industry, government, and the scientific community. The mission of REMA is to consolidate a national network that not only advances scientific research and technological innovation, but also underpins the development and utilization of marine renewable energies in Argentina. The mission aims to consolidate energy sovereignty, reducing dependence on fossil fuels, and mitigating climate change. To achieve these objectives, REMA has laid on a strategic framework that involves evaluating and characterizing renewable energy resources, disseminating scientific technological capabilities and establishing a network of oriented laboratories to push the boundaries of marine energy possibilities and foster an ecosystem for sustainability. Through these endeavors, REMA strives to contribute up to a brighter and more sustainable future for both Argentina and the global community. The, national, uh, the Argentine Network for Marine Energy started with very small virtual meetings. It was just a short while ago, in December 2021, when, uh, uh, when REMA had its handle beginning with only 15 participants. The enthusiasm and short vision of these initial meetings set the foundation for what we have today. Uh, <coughs> then REMA moved to the in-person gatherings. In April 2022, just one week before the seventh core wave energy workshop at the Politecnico di Torino, first time outside Ireland, we had a, our first uh, in-person meeting in Monte Plata. It marked a significant turning point in the journey of REMA. It was during this time that Professor John Brindle suggested to hold uh, holding the NIN core 2023 here in Buenos Aires. It was a proposal that we initially hesitated to accept, even we refused given the magnitude of this event. Yes, his perseverance uh, finally won. Uh, so that's why we, we are here today. So Rema, uh, but also personally, I would like to thank Professor uh, Ringus for, for this. Today, is, it is an incredible opportunity for the Rema, not just for the growth of marine energy in Argentina, but also for the, and, uh, for the entire region. This event goes beyond knowledge sharing. It represents a vital bridge between South America and the European partners. It is an event to reach across border as we collectively advance the frontiers of an energy research and development. The future holds immense promise for REMA. REMA is about to transition into a concept network, which will provide us with a solid platform to extend the potentiality in terms of project, research, funding, and more. This transitioning is evidence uh, of the dedication of everyone involved in, uh, and a recognition for, of the critical role that REMA plays in the marine energy landscape. As I said before, the objective of REMA goes beyond the confines of research. Our mission is to promote not only collaboration among academia, academic and scientific community, but also to forge robust links with the industry. We believe that the strength of our network lies in the bridge, uh, lies in, bridge in the bridge we build uh, dif uh, between different sectors. Together, we can create a sustainable ecosystem for the development of marine renewable energies. It is with, with great, great enthusiasm and optimism that I stand before you today as we inaugurate the NIN Core 2023 Marine Energies Workshop. We are deeply hopeful that this gathering will not only serve as a platform for the exchange of knowledge, but also as a catalyst for strengthening connections within academia and with the industry. The potential for collaboration and innovation in the field of marine energy is boundless and it is my sincere wish that this event will mark the beginning of enduring partnerships that drive progress and transformation. I hope that you make the most of this incredible opportunity. Let's, let us collectively harness the energy and expertise present in this room to, far, uh, to further the growth of marine energy, not only in Argentina, but uh, also across the region. Our combined effort has the power to redefine the future of sustainable energy and contribute to a greener and more resilient world. Lastly, I would like to express my helpful uh, gratitude to all of you for your presence here today, your active participation and engagement 
are the cornerstones of what promised to be a fruitful and insightful worship. I am sincerely, sincerely excited about the days that lie ahead and discoveries, collaboration, and innovation that will undoubtedly unfold during the NIN Core 2023. Together, let us embark on this journey uh, towards a brighter and more sustainable uh, future. So, thanks very much for listening, and that's it. So, now I can. Well, um, it's a real pleasure uh, to be in Argentina and to be in Buenos Aires and, and to uh, be at what I believe is the, uh, the eighth um, workshop on wave energy. Um, I don't remember things quite the same way as Damien does in terms, it sounds like I get an unreasonable proportion of the credit for <laughs> having a workshop here, but in fact it was absolutely nothing to do with me. I mean, uh, Damien was for sure uh, the prime mover in all of this and i think he's he's actually embarrassingly raised the bar as well that um i mean previous workshops uh, were much less uh, elaborate affairs and and in terms of let's say all the connections that you've made i think it's it's certainly brought it to a new level so i wish you every success with the event damien and uh, i'm really delighted that you've 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 uh, taking it on and put so much work into it and I hope you, you reap the rewards as we all should do. Um, yeah, just a, a little bit of history uh, um, in terms of the workshop. It started off um, in 2009 very informally. Um, one of my postdoc students from France, uh, he still maintained good links with EC Nott, where, where, which was his home institution. And he got a grant from the French government, which was to fund some exchanges. So we brought two researchers from the French government and um, coincidentally some researchers from the UK uh, phoned me up I think it was the, earlier that week and said we're thinking of going over and said well why don't you come on Thursday and Friday because the French guys are going to be here so that was the first workshop and I think probably there was somewhere between 10 and 15 people at it and we, we sort of enjoyed the interaction and the, and the informality of it and that, that's what led to I guess um, a growing in, in interest and in numbers as well. Um, I'm reliably informed by Giuseppe, so uh, his memory is better than mine, uh, that this is actually the eighth event uh, in the series. And most of the original events uh, were held in, in Ireland in Maynooth. Um, but last year, uh, Giuseppe organized uh, the event in uh, Torino, which was, it was interesting. And it, it, I find it very interesting how people uh, like Giuseppe and, and Damien say to me, well, can I organize the next one? I mean, you know, people can organize whatever they want. <laughs> I mean, if anyone wants to put the effort in, it's fantastic. So we, we have no ownership of this event, really, you know. Uh, and it's only by your, your, both of your gratitudes that you put the course sticker on it, right? But, but truly, uh, I mean, you put your own marks on the event and, and, and you know, built on previous events. So. As I said, embarrassingly, now you've raised the bar. So we're, we're thinking of having one in Maynooth next year, but I think it's going to be a tall order. Um, it's funny, I was on a bus um, on the way to Matricu at, at the recent UTEC conference, and uh, I had a certain Italian sitting beside me, and he said, can I organize a Maynooth Wave Energy Workshop in Italy next year? And I said, of course you can do whatever you like, you know. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm amazed that people, I, I think it's just that people like the informality of the model. And, uh, you know, it's really about bringing people together, people from different uh, backgrounds and, and different establishments and different sorts of establishments. And indeed, um, in 2024, it uh, looks like there's a good chance we may even have a few wave energy workshops. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's great that people have made the effort to travel here, but it's, it's very much a local event as well, and I think, you know, both Giuseppe and, and uh, Damien brought that flavour to it. And it's really about getting people together at a local level with some input, of course, from, from international people where, where that's possible. So, uh, an ex postdoc of mine, uh, Bing Yang Go, um, he's, he wants to organise an event next year in Xi'an, so if, if any of you have the travelling boat, uh, you can put China on your list as well, if you like to follow the series. Um, I think probably uh, at the moment I'm the only person here who's been to all of them. You know, it's a bit like 
We started the Dublin Marathon in like 1980, and there's people who run all of them, you know. Well, I'm not one of them, but I've been at all the wave energy workshops, you know, and hopefully I'll be at a few more to come. Um, and indeed, in that respect, 2025 is open, so if anyone would like to organize a workshop anywhere in the world, they're more than welcome, uh, and we'll offer whatever uh, help and assistance that we can. So the focus is on, on networking. Uh, we, know we don't have formal papers, we don't have a reviewing system. It's basically just to, 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 to get a bunch of people together from different backgrounds, from, you know, from academia, from industry, uh, from agencies and various other organizations. And it's lovely to see it being um, dovetailed with uh, ENAEM as well, um, you know, to, to increase the, I guess, the applicability and, and the degree of networking as well. So I wish you every uh, success with the event, Damien, and I hope that, that you do enjoy the event. Um, I do have a couple of slides that I, I, I might share, and, and I know that I'm coming between you probably and some cold beers, so I'm not going to hang around too long here. There's just a couple of small slides, but um, maybe we're reviewing as we, we go into the workshop to keep in mind uh, maybe what some of the major issues are. Now, I don't expect you to read all of this. You'll be happy to know, and there will be no examination at the end of today either. Um, and it's just really to chart the major milestones um, that are there in wave energy um, R&D. So, you know, uh, a lot of people will be aware that the first patent of wave energy was, you know, before 1800, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, before uh, 1800, which is a long, long time ago, and, and wave energy has progressed relatively slowly. And it's gone through various troughs and, and peaks in the meantime. Uh, I mean, it, it sort of started as an interesting possibility, and uh, Yoshio Masuda's uh, navigation body was the first real ocean implementation. And it's an interesting one because, you know, it's one of those niche applications. I mean, most of the focus now in wave energy, for example, is on utility-scale electricity. Um, but maybe we need to look at other alternatives to get wave energy to commercialization stage. Uh, but anyway, Masuda did that in, in 1965. So he was a, a naval officer in the, the Japanese Navy. Then um, there was an oil crisis. And of course, when, and, you know, we've had energy crisis recently as well, uh, uh, certainly in Europe, that a lot of people will be aware of. And you know, the, the cost of energy has gone in through the roof. Ireland, for example, is very um, is in a very precarious position because virtually all of our energy is imported. So we're right at the end of, of all of those uh, uh, deliberations and, and, uh, and events. So uh, equally, Ireland has got quite a good uh, renewable energy resource in terms of wave and wind and some tidal. Uh, we don't have a lot of solar. Most people who've been to Ireland figures that it rains most of the time there. So <laughs> maybe solar isn't it. But you know, there's two parts to it. One is supplying uh, the energy demand. And the second is energy security, uh, which is not an insignificant issue either. And, and that's a big issue for Ireland at the moment. But anyway, this oil crisis spurred a lot of development and that's all a lot of the, the, the initial, um, where now we, we would call the godfathers of wave energy, come into to action, such as Stephen Salter with his Salter Duck. And then uh, some, some of this, this work here uh, from Johannes Falnes from uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, so that, that progressed at, at a pace, uh, but then um, the price of oil dropped. And when the price of oil drops, then the, the interest diminishes because you've now got cheap energy from an alternative source and certainly you can't compete with it. Um, I remember being at OMAE, Offshore Mechanics and Arctic Engineering Conference uh, in St. John's 2015. And it's, it's a strange conference because it, it combines people from the oil industry and renewable energy people right, with common interest of ocean engineering. Um, and you would normally think that these two communities have very little in common, uh, but in fact I do remember being at a table with a, an oil and gas guy from Texas, and we were both crying into our soup because just around that year and the previous year, there had been a serious drop in the price of oil, so he was putting people out of work down in the Gulf, and, and from my perspective, there was little interest in wave energy because now it was back to cheap oil again. So, um, you know, the price of oil has been a major decision factor in the level of interest in, in renewable energy and, and wave energy in particular. But then uh, the Kyoto Protocol was signed and, and attention drew, uh, was drawn to you know, the, the, the needs in terms of 
CO2 reduction, and that spurred uh, a whole range of, of uh, commercial uh, outfits. Uh, but then, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we reached a point where a lot of those got to uh, quite a large scale. So, for example, Palamas, I think they had spent uh, the order of between 200 and 250 million uh, UK pounds. Uh, Aquamarine power around about the same level. Um, so they were there, you know, things were getting expensive as you go to large scale with, with large workforces. And they just didn't get over the line as far as it's breaking the sort of commercial barrier is concerned. And that led to a lot of uh, a lack of confidence in the investor community. So, uh, you know, we're, we're back here in what, what I, I would hope, uh, or what myself and Bing Yang, so this is a, a review, from a review done by, by myself and Bing Yang a couple of years ago, that we're in the reboot era with a, a, an increasing and renewed focus uh, on the need for renewables and the need for CO2 reduction via the Paris Agreement. Uh, and hopefully that, uh, along with technical innovation and some collective learning, will, will allow us to make a breakthrough. So well, why hasn't happened? Well, it is complicated. Uh, you know, certainly my background is in control systems, as is a number of other people that are here. And um, I've worked in a variety of applications, and I have to say, uh, of all of them, wave energy is certainly one of the most challenging. Um, one of the difficulties compared to other renewable energy sources, for sure, is that with other renewable energy sources, we generally have an idea of sort of what the basic principle is. So with solar PV, you know, we've got, okay, we've got different materials and things like that. But in general, um, you know, you know what a solar panel looks like, you know how to control it, you know, it's a question of, of altering the, the, the relationship between current and voltage, uh, you know, we can track the sun, things like that. So relatively known. If you ask people what a wind turbine looks like, they tell you it's a big pole in the air, usually with a three grade propeller on it, and that's like that for good reasons. In wave energy, we have over 200 prototypes, and they're not just slight variations on the same thing, they're really all kinds of everything. Uh, so there's very little convergence in the technology, and as a result, there's very little collective learning. And, uh, you know, some companies like, for example, Aquamarine Power are fantastic in sharing all of their bad news as well as their good news that allowed people to learn from their experiences. But uh, overall, you know, we're all still working away in different corners on different sorts of devices. And, you know, you see some of the devices just shown here and they're all completely different. So how much generic um, technological development or, or information um, or learning that you can take from one device to another is, is limited. It's an oscillating power flux that goes back and forth, so it has to be rectified at some stage, either at the, the hydrodynamic level, or aerodynamic level, uh, mechanical level, hyd hydraulic level, or electrical level. Uh, and that's something that has to be done somewhere uh, down the line. As with many other offshore technologies, the hostile environment and maintenance is difficult, you have to target weather windows. Um, in particular with, with WAVE, there are these scaling issues as well, which makes small scale testing or expanding the results to larger scale challenging. And that brings the difficulty of the need to test at larger scale, which brings these increased costs and therefore the, the, the sort of financial challenge that goes with that. Uh, and that has been the valley of death for a number of companies. You know, who have got to the stage where they're, they're getting to full scale and then they, they sort of fall over the cliff. Um, and then the variability in, in the power of waves, and, but they also in their, their period and height, they require adaptability, and that's where control comes in that some of us are, are working on. And unfortunately, given the, the sort of you know, relatively poor commercial experiences of the last decade, investor confidence is currently rather low. So if you look at all the players who are involved, um, you know, there, there, there are various types of people and various types of activities. Uh, and there's a big supply chain as well as fundamental R&D. So you can see there's, there's, you know, and it's very multidisciplinary and diverse, requiring lots of different people and lots of different sorts of people from lots of different sorts of agencies uh, and institutions. Um, in an ideal world, we would have this sort of virtuous circle of industry, academia, and government who, who work hand in hand, but it's rarely the case. You know, I mean, 
for those of us who are, who are in the room here, we, we've all had our trouble probably interfacing with one or other of these uh, other institutions or other uh, uh, collections of people. Um, and there are lots of different aspects that, that will lead to, a, you know, hopefully a, a healthy wave energy market and, and technology development. The market has to be there as well, and there has to be some sort of certainty uh, given to project developers so that they can see 20 years or 25 years ahead that there's going to be some benefit in doing what they're doing, which again is going to create the hunger for the technology, and hopefully that will um, uh, all, uh, you know, I guess work together to, to, to move things on. And there are some interesting role models. So, I mean, Denmark, and we use Denmark as a comparator in Ireland a lot because Denmark has roughly the same population as Ireland. It, it came from a primarily agricultural background. I mean, the population is, you know, about four, four or five million from an agricultural background. But they made a serious decision in the 70s to, to, go, to go with wind. Now, you could argue that wind is a little bit easier because it's more incremental uh, rather than being sort of, you know, it's more evolution than revolution. Or wave energy, really, nobody knows what the right answer is. Uh, but people had an idea in wind energy, and it was more of an evolution. But what was fantastic about the Danish model was that, you know, it started with some serious political movers. And then they created this, this sort of innovation uh, environment, which included support from the government, uh, but also this, this environment where industry could work with academia and, and intellectual property was protected in, in the correct way, uh, but not restricted. And it was spread across all the, the, the researchers and developers uh, to maximize the, the, the advantage. Um, and interestingly, you know, following two big company fallovers in Scotland, which were Aquamarine Power and Calamus, Wave Energy Scotland was set up more or less at the time to protect uh, and uh, further and develop the, the intellectual property that those companies had developed. So they've invested, since they've invested about uh, 200 million UK pounds, uh, and they, they really have improved the, um, uh, the infrastructure. Again, not, not too far away from the Danish model, where you know, intellectual property is, is shared but protected in a sensible way. <coughs> and that creates an environment where everyone can, can uh, sign up for. So uh, can we do it? Well, I suppose there's an imperative to do it in, in terms of climate action, that's for sure. The resource itself is uh, in wave alone is enormous. It's you know, nearly 30,000 terawatt hours per year. And you know, I, I don't have a more recent figure, but the, the, the global consumption in 2018 was just 22,000 terawatt hours. So we, we could actually cover all of our needs in an energy sense. It doesn't mean to say, of course, that you know, when you want to turn your lights on, there's going to be wave energy there to do it. I mean, there's, there's a temporal issue as well. Um, and then there are other re relatively untapped marine renewables, such as uh, tidal is relatively untapped, but yet there are various systems that have been in operation since around about 1960 and work well. And uh, the, the beauty of tidal barrage is that it has a storage element to it as well. Uh, there's ocean thermal gradient, uh, salinity gradient, so for example, at the, the, the mouth of the, the Platter River, uh, floating solar, and then there are combinations of these which could share infrastructure and reduce the costs as well. So, um, who is going to do it? Well, you know, it has to be a collection of people from a lot of different backgrounds and, and a number of different technical disciplines that are involved as well. And certainly some jurisdictions are either more advanced or more focused than others. So, for example, Scotland is probably one of the hot, hot houses at the moment for the development of wave energy. But you can see where that's driven from. It's actually driven from the top. It's driven from the political system that has put and invested in Wave Energy Scotland. And Wave Energy Scotland has in turn incentivized developers and researchers to get involved. Um, and that's you know one of, one of the key places at the moment. So I would say the biggest step is political will, again, going back to the Danish model of wind. So uh, let's maybe think about that for the next few days. And, uh, you know, um, let's bring all of our, our efforts and, and resources to bear and, and try to make, make some, some moves forward. So that's all I have. Thanks.
So now we have some words uh, by Giuseppe Schorz, Dr. Giuseppe Schorz from Politecnico di Torino. So <clears throat> thanks, Giuseppe. Okay. The, the stage is yours. Yeah, here I am. So thank you, Damien. So uh, Damien mentioned that he doesn't like to improvise, uh, so he prepared the script, but he put me on the spot asking for saying something. So I'm going to improvise. But I actually, I prefer to improvise. I get bored if I have to write a script. Uh, so even if you asked me two weeks ago, I would probably improvise anyway. So, <laughs> so the the one thing I want to say, I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes, that um, I would like to share my view on networking and the reason why we're here. So I do believe that all the academic research, political will, which is absolutely important, um, it's imperative. But the one thing we need to do is to collaborate and to network, because this field is a niche. And so we need to share all our information, our knowledge, our experience, and like in Palamis and Oyster, the failures. So not just brag about our successes, but also share experience about the failures. And the best way to do it is to uh, gather and talk and be together and have all these networking uh, opportunities and be open about the, the networking and the collaboration. So uh, I strongly believe in that. So. Uh, chances are that I am wearing the T-shirt of INOR, which is the international network for offshore renewable energy. So, which really uh, is an evidence uh, about how I do believe in networking. This is an organization for uh, facilitating networking among young researchers in offshore renewable energy. Actually, we are here now, but at the same time, there is the European Symposium in uh, Biondo Castello in uh, Portugal, where there are 50 people. Uh, young researchers or PhD and postdocs gathering from the floating offshore wind, tidal, and wave energy, and they are sharing experience. So, that also uh, the same kind of events and efforts are done in North America, but also in South America. So, I strongly suggest you to go and check uh, INO uh, events and opportunities. It's usually uh, totally free for participants and our sponsors that are paid for everything that are investing in young people to uh, to build. Uh, on this new community. And now I want to share something about the Web Energy Workshop, which is, uh, has been always present for me as well. Uh, I wasn't there at the very first one, like John, but um, I started my PhD in 2015, in January, and after two weeks, I was at the first uh, Web Energy Workshop for me, in Minut. Uh, there was the fourth one, I guess, uh, where I was really through there, and I was exposed to a lot of new stuff. And it was my first month of my first year of my PhD. Then after two years, uh, John gave me the opportunity to speak. I was still in the um, So I was a speaker. And then the next edition was 2019. I was back in Italy to the Marine Offshore Renewable Energy Lab in Turin. And John invited me to go to Menut. So he was really suggesting that we should build a bridge between uh, different affiliations. So that's why the, after two years, I decided quite boldly to uh, have uh, an exported edition in, in Italy, so I took the Menu to Energy Workshop abroad. And last year, I have to say, it was a, a huge success. And we inspired Damien to, to do the same and go even farther away uh, to Argentina. So what I want to say now, and I will close, is that Damien really uh, did a lot of work, a wonderful work, and his shoulders are quite heavy now. In a couple of days, it will be lighter. So I want to thank Damien and celebrate tonight and tomorrow and in two days. Thank you, Damien. Thanks very much, Giuseppe, for, for your introduction, your words. Um, uh, it's nice, nice to, to hear you and your perspective about the history of the wave energy workshop. So now, as I said in my introduction, uh, we have several partners that really support us uh, for organizing this event today. And one of the most important partners we have is Pampa Sur, which is uh, an initiative that combines several, several uh, ministries. So now, Daniel Fernandez from Universidad Nacional de Tierra del Fuego will uh, share with us some perspective and definitions about Pampa Sur. So, Daniel.
Well, good afternoon to everybody. So I'm very happy to, to be here and to share a little bit of information about the Pampa Azul initiative. I thought about this short talk, especially for people from abroad, in order to uh, let them know a little bit uh, about the initiative. I am involved in the initiative from the very beginning and I'm <laughs> going to share a little bit of general information and also uh, my own perspective and my own uh, history really in relation to, to Pampa Azul. So uh, I'm actually president of the uh, University of Tierra del Fuego and uh, I think that the Pampa Azul initiative that started uh, officially in 2014 but uh, started really not officially in 2009, so similar to the, the conference that uh, uh, we, are, we are now uh, working at. And uh, so, the, oh, I was, <laughs> the Pampa Azul Initiative is an interministerial initiative that involves seven different ministries in, in Argentina. And uh, as I said, it started in 2014. It was a governmental uh, initiative in order to strengthen the nation's maritime policies. Policies like uh, conservation biology, conservation of natural resources, but also sovereignty, and also uh, in order to learn more about uh, the Argentinian Sea and to be able to uh, develop and administrate marine protective areas. And uh, that came also with a new perspective of the Argentinian uh, country itself, like a bicontinental uh, perspective that you can see in this map that is in the right side of the screen. So we find out, we learn, and we are trying to uh, have this new perspective where the sea is quite important, as important as the land of our country. And also in the last years, the uh, continental shelf was expanded by the work that was done by a special committee that worked on that. So most of the uh, continental shelf is not only 200, 200 uh, miles away from the coast, but also in some parts 315 miles away from the coast. And uh, in the map we can see the importance of the uh, sea in relation to the land. Argentina was always a country that worked on agriculture, that worked on livestock, but nowadays our government decided that we should also work on maritime uh, resources. So, uh, as I said before, there are seven different ministries involved in this uh, initiative. The Ministry of Security, the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, Tourism and Sports, and of course, uh, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. And that's not very common in Argentinian history. I mean, I'm a marine biologist myself, I work in uh, things related to the sea, and it's the first time we have a project like this that involves uh, so many parts of the government and also uh, that allow us to, to work in a different time scale and in a different geographical scale. Myself, I, I work in uh, Tierra del Fuego, Ushuaia, and I, I moved there from Buenos Aires in 1994, and until uh, Pampa Azul started, I was always working very close to the city like probably, I don't know, a few miles away from the city, I never had the opportunity to work in the Argentinian Sea, and less to work in Antarctica. And after 2009, we were able, all the people that work in Argentina in relation to the sea, to work every year, every summer in the Argentinian Sea, and also to go to Antarctica. And I think that was a huge change, and uh, allowed us to do, to, to ask some questions that before we couldn't even think about. And that's important, and the support of this kind of uh, initiatives 
for many years is something that changed uh, our way of uh, doing science in Argentina, at least in relation to the sea. So, five different areas were, uh, were qualified as a priority, and we've been working in these five different areas since uh, 2009. Uh, the Rio de la Plata River, the fluvial and marine system that is close to the Rio de la Plata River. The set break from, that is a front. So the separate front, there is a front that is running to get closer. Sorry, <laughs> too many things at the same time. And in English. <laughs> so uh, so the, the front comes from north to south and it's very rich. And uh, one special place was uh, decided to, to work on the blue hole. That is very important because of the biodiversity that is found in there. And also the San Jorge Golf, that is quite important for the productivity. The Banco Burdu, that is important because of biodiversity in uh, cold waters and also geopolitically. And it's very close to Antarctica and it's close to the other foil, the place where I live. <laughs> and uh, finally, the last one, uh, Georgia's and Sandwich Island. So, I have a, a short video about it. Well, it's just a video about the things that I've been saying, but a little bit better in terms of the image and uh, why every place was uh, chosen. Some of the places are rich in biodiversity, some of the places are rich because of the productivity, and as I said before, also geopolitically, some of the places are important for Argentina, and that's why we would like to learn more about those places. So personally, I, I can say how this impacted my own work. So I started in 2009 for the first campaigns. We had to, uh, we were able to use this boat. That is the Puerto de Seattle. Maybe most of you know it, but it is a ship that belonged to Conicet, but one was, was not used for this kind of campaigns before 2009. In 2009, we were told that we could start thinking about uh, working at the sea in different places and uh, we started to, to build our own nets, for example, to do fishery research. I work with fishes and fisheries and uh, it was like we had to begin from scratch because we didn't have the tools and we started uh, making a network as the one that you are doing in, the, in, uh, in relation to wave energy and we started working together with many people that used to work in the same subjects, but we were all separated in our efforts. And uh, Pampa Sur helped us to, to work in a network uh, manner, and it, it was very important for us. Uh, for example, I, I have a lab in uh, Tierra del Fuego, we are about 20 people, and every year a couple of us were able to go to Argentina and see, a couple of us were able to go to Antarctica, and as I said before, that allowed us to ask different questions that we couldn't uh, afford to do before because of this change of scale. And um, I have some pictures of different campaigns just to represent the effort that was done in these years. And I hope this will continue because it's important. I mean, it's a lot of money, a lot of, uh, it's a political decision, as uh, it was said before about wave energy. And I think we need to keep on doing this in order to know more about our, our seas. 
So this is just one example of questions that we were able to answer este, after these efforts. You have uh, some maps in the top of the image, the maps for different uh, stations of the year. So you have winter, autumn, spring, and, and summer of the Argentinian Sea. And you can see, because of the amount of chlorophyll, the productive places in the Argentinian Sea. But these are integrative uh, data, no? So you have three months in, in each map, and maybe you miss things that happen in a different scale. So you have oops, sorry. you have a, a satellite image here of a, play, a moment that we've done a campaign in uh, in Namukuraba Kuburgut, and at that moment you can see like a bloom, algam bloom in the part of a bank that you were not able to see in any of these maps. So, working at a different scale, at a different time scale, if you go to a place several weeks in the year, several months during the year, you can learn things that maybe with integrative data you cannot uh, learn. And that's important for us because, for example, in this place, in the Namukuraban Kuburgut, there are a lot of phytoplankton blooms we learn now, so it's a very productive area, even if you don't see that in these maps. It's a place for uh, nursery of different species of fish, like, no sé, uh, Marusa Negra, a species that we know quite a lot and it's been explored in the Southern Ocean quite heavily, and uh, many other species that are related to, to Antarctica. So the research areas were biodiversity and conservation, climate change, geological and geophysical exploration, fisheries research, environmental risk management, management, and human activities and coastal marine environment. Many universities work in these campaigns. All the, the universities that are at the coast of Argentina were involved. And as I said before, we were able to, to build a network that is already working and allow us to, to, to work in a better way than before. Also, there are a lot of things related to technology, and I think this is the strong link with this uh, Congress, because uh, we, we have to build our own nets, as I said before, we, we need to, to build our own traps, but also we learn about the problems that we have with our neighbor industry, and the, the not, not enough vessels that we have for doing this, this research on the field, maybe, if we need to, to build a new vessel, we couldn't, we couldn't do it in Argentina for some reason. And, uh, the energy and mining industry could be already, are already involved and could be involved uh, more strongly probably in this kind of efforts. And in this uh, Congress, probably we talk about some of these subjects that we, we have to develop. And, uh, well, the other things I, I already said something about the fishing, tourism, especially tourism related to Antarctica, that is something that is growing a lot in these years. Finally, uh, there are different networks related to technology. One is the REMA, that I don't know if already belongs to Pampa Sur, but I think uh, the subject that you talk about and you uh, do research about has to be related to, to Pampa Sur, uh, of course. There are other networks like Roma, Marine Observation Network, that is quite incipient, but there are a lot of uh, efforts in, in building this network. Uh, two or three weeks ago, we had a meeting in Tierra del Fuego, and some of the first uh, apparatus in order to uh, do monitor the, the sea were installed two or three weeks ago. And this effort is, is an ongoing effort, and some other ones have been uh, working for, for many years already. And finally, uh, the universities are also involved in, uh, in human resources training program. Two years ago, there were 15 uh, grants for each university that are located at the coast of Argentina Sea in order to have more people studying the sea. And also we decided, because we think that it's a complex, it's a complex uh, 
subject, of course, but we need to uh, work in an interdisciplinary way in order to learn more about this complex subject. So the grants were not only related to biology or geology or environment, we have uh, grants for economy, for history, for politics, and we think we have to go on in that way. I mean, trying to make a, to, to learn more about this complex subject, studying it in the whole complexity that it has. Uh, I'm saying always this is the last one. This is the last one, uh, for sure. And there, there's one thing that we know in Tierra del Fuego, and it's uh, we are trying to uh, make a more complex uh, productivity matrix of the province. The province uh, has some exemptions of uh, what do you say? Um, taxes. Going taxes. Yeah. Thanks. Going out of work. Uh, and uh, so we need to to build new or to have new projects in order to build new equipment to go further away from TVs and cell phones and some other things that we are building. And the companies have to invest some of the money that we're, they are not paying in taxes in these new projects. And from the university, and with the help of all the other public universities of Argentina, we are thinking which subject we could work on. And some of the subjects that we think we, got, we can work on are related to the uh, sea, are related to marine technology and marine energy. And I think that maybe some of the things that we are going to listen in this conference could help us think if we can develop some of this stuff in, in the Alpha. That would be quite important. And uh, I really would like to stay here these two years, two, these two days, the next two days. But I have to go to, to Mar del Plata because we have a, a conference on Pampasul as well tomorrow and the day after. So I'm fortunate to be here only today. Thanks a lot. So now we have uh, some uh, little information about the organization of the, the workshop. Uh, this meeting we have today, today here and tomorrow and the day after. So we have poster exhibition just in the second floor uh, through the stairs. So there we will also have coffee breaks. So um, social activities there like working or something like that. We we have booked the the room just in front of this auditorium for networking and meetings and. We know that there are here several groups for in different topics, for example, autonomous marine vehicles. So you can use that space if you want to, to gather there. And, and of course, we have a couple, actually three or maybe four social activities. We have more social activities than, than talks, I think. <laughs> but we have uh, we have uh, today uh, snacks and drinks. Years, of course, just in the, in the building next to this one. So, do we have a name for the building? Or a name for the building is. Okay. Okay, it's just. Okay, it's just at the corner of this block, so uh, we will all go all together, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then we, we have booked uh, tables for dinner just crossing the street. So it's a kind of chain, chain of uh, activities. So we start here and we end up in the next block. Uh, and then we have tomorrow pres uh, uh, sorry, presentations. We have coffee breaks, poster exhibition, the exhibition, as I said, in the second floor through the stairs. Um, then we have, again, beers and dinner. Uh, in I don't know exactly where, but we have all the information in the web on the website, sorry. And same thing on Wednesday. Wednesday. If you have questions, you can ask us. Um, we are here to, to assist and help you to have a very, very productive and nice stay in, in Buenos Aires for, for this workshop. So that's it.